Hello and welcome back everyone. I'm Linnea Lucan, Research Fellow at the Heartland Institute's Arthur B. Robinson Center on Climate and Environmental Policy. This is the third episode in our energy series and today we're going to talk about biofuels, specifically those that are used in place of or in addition to gasoline. Ethanol and biodiesel are often propped up as these eco-friendly alternatives for regular gas, but are they? We're going to explore what these fuels are, how they're possibly a net detriment to the environment and even to human health. Ethanol is a simple alcohol, like the kind we drink, but for this video we're specifically talking about it in the context of a gasoline additive or replacement. Ethanol is a biofuel and it's going to be made from corn, sugarcane, or other agricultural products. Biodiesel, on the other hand, is made from vegetable oil, plant-based oils from other sources, and sometimes even used cooking grease. In the United States, most of the biodiesel you'll see is going to be made from soybeans. There are a few reasons why we use ethanol in our fuel, but the primary reason right now is because it's government mandated, at least at the levels that we use it today. The oil embargo of 1973 convinced the U.S. government that we needed to find some other source, a alternative fuel or an additive in order to reduce our need for foreign oil. In 2002, an additive that we were using as an oxygenate called methyl tertiary butyl ether was suspected of contaminating groundwater and was subsequently banned. If you don't know about it yet, you will. It's a gasoline additive that is contaminating drinking water from Maine to California and has been called the biggest environmental crisis of the next decade. How did MTBE end up in gasoline? Well, 10 years ago, Congress told the oil companies to put it there, either MTBE or some other oxygenate that would make gasoline burn cleaner. Ethanol replaces MTBE as the oxygenate that we use in our fuel today. Further cementing ethanol's spot in our fuel blends today was the Energy Policy Act of 2005. That's when Congress passed what's called the Renewable Fuel Standard Program. This policy requires that more and more of these so-called renewable fuels are used over time. You can see this change reflected in this chart that I've included from the Energy Information Administration. Um, really clearly, you can see a huge jump in the amount of ethanol that's used in our fuel mix. And it's obvious that it's the Energy Policy Act that promoted it, not a natural growth of the technology. Besides the politics and the government mandates, People who are big supporters of ethanol blending are going to argue that it's beneficial in some other ways, not just for getting us off of foreign oil. As I'll discuss later, there's reasons why that excuse itself is obviously not good enough. Uh, but they'll also say that ethanol has a higher octane value than gasoline, meaning it burns more slowly and can increase that energy efficiency just a bit. High performance cars need a higher octane rating uh, because they tend to have higher compression ratios in their engines and they need a fuel that won't ignite too quickly. Blending ethanol into the gasoline can improve that octane rating. Biodiesel, similar to ethanol, has a better cetane rating, which is a similar concept. Concerns about climate change have also led some people to promote ethanol. They argue that it's a renewable fuel with a lower carbon dioxide emissions than gasoline, um, but there is a catch to that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So everything sounds pretty straightforward and reasonable, except it's not quite so simple. Let's just start with the replacement value of ethanol for gasoline. Despite having that higher octane rating that I talked about, ethanol has significantly lower energy density than gasoline. So about 20 megajoules per liter for ethanol, while gasoline produces about 33 megajoules per liter. As a result, your fuel economy will decline when ethanol and biodiesel are used and blended into your regular gasoline or diesel. Um, it takes about one and a half times more fuel to travel the same distance on a biofuel than on um, gasoline alone. And the more biofuel you add, the lower that vehicle's fuel economy becomes. Ethanol also attracts water, which can separate out and cause all sorts of engine problems, especially in smaller engines. Uh, this is also part of the reason why it's not shipped by pipeline. It causes way too many issues down the line, it shortens the life of the pipeline itself, and it can also cause some damage to some of the monitoring equipment that they put on the pipelines. Um, ethanol blends are not safe for use in small engines like a lawnmower or a weed whacker boats or many other older vehicles because it corrodes the rubber components and also some plastics. 
Biodiesel also has a gelling problem, or it begins to form ice crystals and you get a sort of waxy mixture um, at a higher temperature than regular diesel fuel will. So in extreme cases, it can begin to gel at temperatures as high as 60 degrees, but usually it's more often around something like 14 degrees and below if you have a halfway decent biofuel. Um, this is why there's a blend change in the winter if you ever notice that the gasoline blends or the diesel blends are a little bit different in the northern states than they are in the south. It's because different blends of biodiesel have uh, some different petroleum-based additives in order to mitigate that effect. During that polar vortex a few years ago, trucks coming out of states that don't normally have to winterize their fuel as much, like Florida, were getting stuck on the highway or at overnight truck stops, especially if they stopped for a few hours, as their fuel gelled in the extreme cold. As for emissions, when fuel economy, like I talked about it before, is taken into account, ethanol does not look quite so good. In kilograms of CO2 per energy output equivalent, ethanol comes in at about 4 kilograms of CO2 and regular gas at 3.3. Not a huge difference there, but it's not the CO2 savings that proponents advertise either. Also, if you take into account the land use and the production of ethanol feedstocks, at least one study found that corn ethanol emissions under the renewable fuel standard are likely to be about 24% higher, actually, and that's just CO2. Another study shows that using higher ethanol fuel blends increases air pollutants like particulate pollutants, ozone, sulfur oxides, especially during the summer months in some places, like especially downtown in big cities like Los Angeles. Um, the EPA agrees, which is one reason why usually higher percentage ethanol blends like E15 are not allowed to be sold in the summertime. Other countries, in particular Brazil, which relies heavily on E85 ethanol fuel for their vehicles, uh, suffer from the expansion of sugar cane plantations into the Amazon and other once protected ecosystems and wetlands. Um, cities in Brazil actually have quite a bit of ground level air pollution due to high ethanol use. Because more land is being dedicated to the type of corn used for ethanol, less is available for food. So some estimates find that the price of corn was driven up by something like 30% due to the renewable fuel standard mandates. But what about decreasing our dependence on foreign oil? That's something that's pertinent right now and important, and a lot of people care about that, including myself. Well, as I've explained in the first video of the series, fracking and other innovative exploration and production techniques have radically changed the balance of U.S. import and exports on both natural gas and oil. This chart that you see is from the Energy Information Administration, and you can see how sudden the change was. Interestingly, this is a little bit after the renewable fuel standards came into play, but since ethanol really never displaced all that much foreign oil in the first place, because we're still only blending it up to maybe 15% in some areas at some times of the year, we can't attribute that climb to that policy. In fact, the regulations on blending biofuels are so out of touch, we actually have been forced to import a lot of those fuels, especially when companies try to meet the unrealistic requirements demanding increasing amounts of cellulosic biofuel which is just an entire nightmare of its own. Cellulosic biofuel is made from wood chips, switchgrass, other kind of woody or fibrous materials, not necessarily the fruit or like the grain of a corn or something. Um, a waiver is included in this requirement though. The EPA themselves say in a June 2020 updated rules document that the projected volumes of cellulosic biofuel production for 2020, 2021, and 2022 are all significantly less than the volume targets in the statute. Since production cannot be met of cellulosic biofuels due to the unreliability and the low yield of that fuel, plus constant commercial failures of facilities that have been set up to produce it, the EPA was forced to adjust their standards and their expectations on it. We also should briefly cover the renewable identification numbers, or RINs, or I think I'm going to call them RINs for the rest of this, uh, because they're at the center of a lot of controversy, and it's one of those things in the ethanol mandates that make the whole situation seem a little bit more like a scam of some kind than an actual policy. Smaller refiners and gasoline retailers can't easily keep up with these mandates to blend more and more ethanol into gasoline over time. So renewable identification numbers, or those RINs, are available as a sort of credit system to smaller companies so that they can purchase them from larger, more integrated companies, as in those that have, you know, an exploration for oil and the refining process all the way down the line. Uh, 
those companies are more able to make more ethanol blend fuel than they necessarily need. And so every gallon of biofuel gets a unique RIN or RIN number. In other words, RINs are certificates that are generated by companies that make or blend or import biofuels and are purchased by other fuel makers or retailers so that they can remain compliant with the Renewable Fuel Standards program. It's a little bit like a biofuel cap and trade, but with no cap. According to EPA data, as of 2020, RINs can cost anywhere from a few cents to $3.50 per gallon of fuel. As the mandates increased over time, the RINs increased in price. The higher costs are then passed on to consumers usually, or it's resulted in totally driving small mom and pop gasoline stations out of business. Retail companies like Walmart that can blend their own fuel and get those RINs are able to sell them back to refiners they buy their gas from as basically like a subsidy where they can then get a big discount from the refiners and become far more competitive in gasoline pricing than the smaller retailers like those mom and pop shops I was talking about could ever afford. There have been issues with people fraudulently producing RINs without actually making any fuel as a result of how easy it is to just trade in these certificates instead of a physical product. The RIN system is a really complex issue and one that we could probably take a few hours discussing, but I think this is sufficient for a brief overview. Many complex issues arise with the use and especially the government mandated use of these biofuels. I would argue that more and more people are starting to see that these problems are there a lot more clearly than they had in recent decades. Um, but to wrap it up, my thought is this. While biofuels have some limited benefits as an octane booster and in some racing sports especially, um, and I've also heard arguments that leftover fermented grain makes good food for livestock, uh, the benefits don't really outweigh the significant costs broad biofuel mandates from the federal government have imposed. This is especially the case because we could easily be energy independent without it. And, you know, maybe ethanol will make sense in the future if researchers can discover a cost-effective way of producing it from switchgrass or those cellulosic biofuels that I was talking about or other agricultural waste. Um, but corn makes a lot more sense as food than as fuel. And I'd argue that corn-based grain alcohols are better served on the rocks. No, I thought not. May I suggest a drink, sir? Bourbon, perhaps? That sounds perfect. Hey everyone, make sure to subscribe and hit the like button, and if you are so inclined, share this video. It helps us out a lot. Uh, there are two other videos in this series so far that you can take a look at. Um, the links might be on the screen, and they might be somewhere else. Uh, also check out our weekly Climate Roundtable live stream. We have a lot of fun every Friday at noon central time. If you have any suggestions for future energy series videos, let me know in the comments. Hope you all enjoyed this, and thanks for watching.